the recording is going to be on the reproductive system, but we're concentrating mostly on the male system, and I'll do a separate lecture on the female system. The primary sex organs are, are gonads, and in the male, it's the testes, and the female, it's the ovaries, and they produce gametes. Now, the gamete in the male is going to be your sperm, in the female, your egg. They also secrete sex hormones, androgens such as testosterone in the male and the females, estrogen and progesterone. And the reproductive system, okay, I told you about the primary sex organs, but you also have accessory reproductive organs, things like ducts, glands, and external genitalia. Probably the very things that most people think are the main parts are just accessory organs. Okay, sex hormones. They play a huge role in the development of the reproductive organs themselves, sexual behavior and drives, and growth of various other organs and tissues. Uh, we'll talk about that more detail shortly. Now, in the male system, we have the testes, which are within the scrotum, and they produce sperm and sperm are going to be delivered to the external world and the goal of reproduction is for them to then be eventually uh, delivered to the uterine tube so that you actually are fallopian tube so you actually get a pregnancy but it goes from the testicle proper to the epididymis then to the ductus deferens, deferens ejaculatory duct and urethra and i have pictures so we'll get to those in a minute. Accessory sex glands. We have three. The seminal vesicles, prostate, and bulbourethral glands. And they create into ducts during jack. Actually, mix it and make it into usable semen. Okay, a picture everyone has been looking forward to here, I'm sure. This... Let me get just a hand here for a minute. Let's see. The pointer here shows this is your penis, this is your testes, the epididymis, the ductus deferens, and it goes around through in of the pubis and through the wall of the abdomen over here over the urinary bladder, and it widens here and to become the ampulla of the ductus deferens. And you have a big gland right here called the seminal vesicle that produces a lot of the fluid involved with the, the semen. The ejaculatory duct is what we call, it's the same tube now. It was the ductus deferens, also known as the vas deferens. And it, here at this point, it's going through the prostate gland. Now, this is a 2D picture, but picture... Uh, it's a 1D thing. Like, if you wanted to make a picture for yourself, you could use your left pointy finger and hold it up. Now take your right hand and put it completely around the pointy finger. You see this prostate goes completely around the ejaculatory duct as well as the urethra. This is the uh, initial, where this is the urinary bladder. And this is where the beginning of your urethra and they come together. The urethra goes here and on out and then out. Now it produces, it eliminates urine, it eliminates uh, sperm, but not at the same time. Because if it happened at the same time, then the, the urine would kill the sperm. Now, one little thing I always point out on this page is this little gland right here. This is a bulbo urethral gland, very small. And what it does is before the actual ejaculation, just right before, it produces a, a little substance, a little fluid that lines, it neutralizes any urine that's in the urethra, just lines it. And it's the pre-ejaculate. I know y'all have better words for that, but I just can't say it in a lecture. But uh, this actually, as you see, is the anus. 
And the way, the only way that uh, you can easily feel for enlargement in the prostate is through a digital rectal exam because you see the prostate is right here. But if you notice, you don't see the whole thing. But if it's gigantically enlarged, you can tell that. Okay, we got other pictures that will show more on the individual parts of the penis. We'll go to the scrotum and testes next. Okay, the scrotum is the skin and then superficial fascia, which is just uh, under the skin, hangs outside of the abdominal cavity. And you have your testes, paired testes. Now, the reason for having a scrotum and not having retained testes, now females have their ovaries are retained in their body, but the male, they're below it because you have to have three degrees Celsius lower body temperature than core body temperature, or the sperm do not, are not produced. Now, if testes are not, uh, do not let down and they're not, there's no surgical intervention, two things happen. One is you have sterility and infertility. The other is the number one cause of testicular cancer is a retained testicle, one still in the body. Okay, now the temperature is kept constant by two sets of muscles. There's the dartos muscle, which is in the skin and wrinkles the scrotum when it's cold, it pulls it closer. And then the cremaster muscle, which pulls it up and down and up and down and always this is a good example I have to bring this in even though that we're not in the classroom always if you want to join in a conversation and you want to say something intelligent be sure you know what you're talking about because a group of my students went to a class right after mine and the teacher said oh what did you study today they said we studied all about our dartos in cremaster muscles and he said Oh, I exercise every day to keep mine in great shape. And they just sat there and didn't say a word. So, anyway, okay, now we're even getting better on our pictures here. We've got, let me get back to the little hand here. This entire thing is a spermatic cord. And it, you can see it's come through the peritoneal cavity. At some point in that uh, fetal development, the, you actually had a pulling down of the test, and, and I'm not sure if it's in this PowerPoint or not, but what happened is you have a little structure in the scrotum that's attached to the testes, and it's called the gubernaculum. I know you think I made that up, but it pulls the testicle down, rips it through the inguinal ring here, so through the muscles. And that's no doubt one reason that men are apt to get hernias here if they lift too heavy a weights or whatever. But anyway, and this spermatic cord completely wraps around your cremaster muscle and then the other stuff that's in here, the ductus deferens or vas deferens. Now, if one was going to do, or one were going to do a vasectomy, that's what they cut is the vas deferens. And they cut it down relatively close to the testes. We sure. um, you see all this blue stuff? That's the pam pam pinniform venous plexus. Bunch of vascularity. There's also a lot of arteries that are not really pictured here. And it may not shock you to know there's autonomic nerve fibers. There are also a lot of sensory fibers going down to this testes because the testicle is the source of the man's um, survival into the next generation. And so he's got to be protective of it. And he's, therefore, it causes great pain if there's any harm that comes to it. And then you have layers. I think I may have a better picture, but you have a double wrapper here. The internal wrapper, the, the external wrapper is the tunica vaginalis because it's around and actually evaginates and I don't have the other picture here. And this is your penis. This is, <clears throat> this is a uncircumcised penis. So um, if when it's uh, erect, it will push on beyond that skin. 
Now, circumcision is very controversial. What it does that's good, they just remove the skin above on the uh, glands, commonly known as the head of the penis. What is good about uh, doing a circumcision, and it's required in some religious, uh, I think the Muslims and the uh, Jewish people are required. I don't know what other religions require it, but it, it decreases the chance of urinary tract infections at the very, in the very young and the very old. Babies and little boys, they reach a stage where they're too old for mommy to clean the thing and two to do it right themselves. And then they get to be 92 and you're back into the same thing. They don't want anybody taking care of or cleaning it, but it still has got to be cleaned or it gets infected and can cause horrendous issues if you don't. Infection here is just not pleasant. Uh, the things against circumcision is it's a really, really mean way to treat a little kid. You know, they're generally newborn the first few days. Uh, some, uh, hopefully, more and more physicians use a local anesthetic, which certainly helps. Okay, now the testes, here we have the names of them. The tunica vaginalis, that's part of the peritoneum, and then the tunica albuginea, which is the fibrous capsule around the testes. And you have septa that are divided. One testes is divided into 250 to 300 lobules. Each of these contain one to four seminiferous tubules. Sperm is produced in these seminiferous tubules. And this just is a list, seminiferous tubules, tubulus rectus, reed testes, efferent ductules, and epididymis. Now, hopefully we have a picture coming up. Well, not yet. The blood supply from the testicular arteries come from the testicular arteries and testicular veins. And then the spermatic cord, just as I mentioned, encloses nerve, nerve fibers, blood vessels, and lymphatic vessels that supply the testes. Okay, here we have a picture of the testicle. Now, this is grossly, grossly disproportional because this is a seminiferous tubule, according to your picture. Now, we have 250 little sections with four of those in it. So that means you've got to have a thousand of these in one testicle. Obviously, that's disproportional. They did it that way to make it be easy to see. Uh, it's a little bit crazy, but anyway, they're formed here and we have different pictures. And then they go into the reedy testes here and then into the efferent ductule and then into the epididymis. This is the head and this is the tail of the epididymis. Now, the epididymis is for storage and maturation of the sperm. It's got to sit here just a little while before it develops properly. Now, if one were going to do a vas vasectomy, ductus or vas deferens, right here is what you're going to get rid of. And the best method is to cut a good size section out and burn it and do everything imaginable. I don't know where that line came from nor how to get rid of it. Oh, well, we'll just sit there with it. Oh, that got rid of it. But um, this is to get a big section of this gone. Sometimes they can be reversed. I would suggest to any male or female, if you don't, <clears throat> if you aren't sure you're through having babies, don't get it done because a lot of reversals don't work. Another option would be to pay to have sperm stored, but that's very expensive. Okay, now we have interstitial cells, also known as Leydig cells, and these produce the androgens, your testosterone. So our picture here, this is a seminiferous tubule. You have about a thousand of these, and you can see the developing sperm here. Outside of this, interstitial cells, these produce your testosterone. 
And we have one more type of sale that's not mentioned here, which is your Sertoli sale. And I'll go ahead and mention what it does. They're going to be along this border here because the initial part of the sperm development is the same DNA as the man. These are not the same DNA. It's been divided up. And so the immune system could attack, the, well, would attack the sperm and we would not exist anymore. These myoid cells, little muscular cells, help contract and push the sperm forward. Okay, now the penis. I know you've been waiting all semester to hear about the penis. And I actually waited to do this lecture until my husband was gone because it kind of freaks him out to hear me even say the word. But the external genitalia are the scrotum and the penis. This is just, you know, kind of stupid to even say. It's, the penis is a male copulatory organ. Copulate is to get it on. The penis, and I think what I'm going to do is go to pictures, talk about all this stuff, and we never will get anywhere with it. Okay, we have here, this is our urinary bladder. We've gone back to our testicle here, epididymis, ductus deferens. Here's your seminiferous tubule. Here's your prostate that goes round and round and round. Bulbourethral glands. You remember how I said that the bulbourethral gland is, gives you the little pre-ejaculate that lubricates to la allow the sperm to go? One problem, some people think withdrawal method is a reasonable method of birth control. I know several children who have been produced by people saying they use that method, but it obviously did not work. But what happens when it doesn't work is either they don't withdraw it when they're supposed to, but the other is sperm can get stuck up here in the bulbo urethral glands. It'll live a couple of days. So when they go out, some sperm goes out. And how many sperm does it take to make a baby? One, right? Okay. Now we have a prostate goes completely around here. Uh, this is a prostatic urethra. The membranous urethra is in here in between. And this is a penile urethra here. Now we have, these pictures look awful small to me uh, on this thing. Hopefully they look bigger to you if you're not looking on your phone. Okay, this is the root of the penis, this is the shaft, and this is the glands. If you have another word for it, that's not the right word. This is anatomy. And within this, you have your erectile tissue, so it can enlarge or decrease in size. This here and here, it looks like a sort of a frowny face. It's a cross section of the penis, which makes it brown, I would think. The corpora cavernosa is here and here. These are your erectile tissues. They fill with blood. As more blood goes in, it cuts off the outflow and it even gets larger. But to keep the urethra from being closed, you have erectile tissue that actually holds the urethra open. And then within this, you have vascularity, deep arteries. So, and there's vessels here, so the dorsal aspect. And I guess that is about it. We've already talked about the prepuce or foreskin. Okay, now, the epididymis, uh, we've mentioned a couple of things I'll add. We do have microvilli that absorb testicular fluid that you don't need and pass nutrients that the sperm does need. Now, I'm just going to draw a picture here. Okay, I'm really bad at drawing. Here's an egg, and that's this little nucleus here. See all that cytoplasm it has here? Lots of room for nutrition. Okay, I think I can erase that here. I'll put my egg. Whoops, I lost my pencil. Okay, there's an egg. A sperm is just a nucleus and a tail and a little acrosome. Where'd his cytoplasm go? He ditched it. So there's nothing to keep these little guys alive except for the external nutrients they get. And they get these from all these, uh, 
all the fluid that is dumped, starting with the epididymis. And non, they're non-modal. That means they're not going to move as they go through the epididymis. And then as they pass through it, they get to where they become more modal. And during ejaculation, the epididymis contracts and sperm is ejected into the ductus deferens. And it passes through the inguinal canal, protect, projects from the epididymis, and then out through the urethra. And now, this vasectomy we already mentioned, but this is kind of a scary word here. Nearly 100% effective form of birth control. So if you get a vasectomy or your spouse gets a vasectomy, you got to get it checked to be sure that there's no sperm coming out and they're just shooting blanks because there's no difference. I, I, I had a former employer back when I was in veterinary medicine, a male, who had a vasectomy, and he called me on the phone to tell me that you couldn't tell the difference. And I went, why do people tell me this? But anyway, if, I wish you could see my face. I'm making ugly faces. Here, I'll make a frowny face. Ugh, 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 ugh. There. I don't want to hear that. But anyway, but I, you, it is good I know that it's the, after the vasectomy, it's just so little fluid that not, doesn't go out that the man can't tell the difference. Okay, now we've already talked about the parts of the urethra conducts urine and semen, but at different times. Cannot happen at the same time without killing the semen or sperm. Prostatic, membranous, and spongy. We've already mentioned that. Um, the accessory glands, the first one we showed you a picture of, seminal vesicle. It's a viscous, means thick kind of alkaline seminal fluid. It's fructose. It's a sugar that's readily absorbed by the sperm for nutrition, ascorbic acid, uh, coagulating enzymes, and prostaglandins. And this is 70% of the semen volume. And then it joins the ductus deferens, and we get the ejaculatory duct. And then the prostate puts the next fluid in, milky, slightly acetic. And it has uh, citrate, enzymes, prostatic-specific antigen, PSA. And we'll talk about this in just a second. And it's important for activation of the sperm. In fact, if you remove the prostate, it will cause infertility, or probably total sterility, if you remove the entire thing. And then, um, we next look out a little prostatitis. This is one of the most more common reasons that men will go to a, uro a urologist. It causes painful or difficult urination because you basically, let's just make this be the urethra. And I tell, I'm really bad at drawing. The prostate completely encircles it, and it crunches down on it like a boa constrictor or a snake crunching its so that the urethra may only have this much room when it needs to have this much room. And therefore, it's uh, difficult, and they can totally block from this. Uh, but generally, a man is going to go to the hospital when he gets in that state if you live in the first world. If you live in a third world country, then they may die of that. Symptoms of prostatitis, pain in the groin, pelvic area, genitals. They may even have flu-like symptoms. It's often bacterial, not necessarily a sexually transmitted infection, but it could be. Prostate cancer. This is the most common cancer in men. Uh, in 2009, this is kind of old data, 206,640 men in the U.S. were diagnosed with prostate cancer. 28,088 died of it. Now, that's not a real high percentage. Most prostate cancer is easily treated and is not a very fast growing, most types. Okay, screening for prostate makes me mad. I'm glad I don't work on humans. Digital rectal exam. Uh, they actually, you know, put a glove on, go through the anus, and feel for lumps and bumps in the prostate. And you can pick up a grossly enlarged prostate that way. 
Now, I don't recommend that you do that with a pit bull without first putting a muzzle on. I'll leave it at that. Okay, prostate-specific antigen test. This is very specific. Um, if a person has prostate cancer, it may be a really high number. They could be prostatitis, the other things that could be causing it. But if it's extremely high, now I don't know what the numbers are. I don't remember because we don't do this test in my species. But like I think it's real low if it's normal, like four or five, four or five watts. I don't know. But if it's 65, real good chance they have cancer. 45. It's very bad. Then you're going to need to find out what to do. Okay, treatment for prostate cancer. Now, this sounds crazy. Watchful waiting, active surveillance. Just check it every year. Do ultrasound. Do check, check it over. Digital exam. See if it seems to be growing. Because most grow so slowly. If you've got a man that's 82 and he gets a small prostate cancer, he's probably more apt to die of the surgery to remove that prostate than he is of just the cancer itself. Okay, radical prostatectomy. This is um, generally said to cause impotence and possibly incontinence. So not something most men want to sign up for. This is the big thing that people are really big into using now, radiation therapy. They can either take and put little radiation and radioactive pellets actually in, into the tumor. The man will be under anesthetic. Or he can go and get radiation that's directed, an electron beam, electron beam accelerator that actually shoots radiation directly into that prostate without really doing much damage to the skin or surfaces around it, only hits the tumor. And that works well. The pellets work well. Hormone therapy, that's just basically um, giving them estrogen, trying to get rid of their testosterone. Not a popular therapy, but it is done in dogs. Neuter them and give them a few estrogen shots and they'll get over it. I did that with one dog and then we'd check him every so often. And the cancer, I mean, the prostate was just shrinking to nothing and he felt so much better, but then he came in for his estrogen shot and I got a call. The man said he jumped off the truck and ran away and he never found him. I don't think he liked being neutered and getting his estrogen shots. Cryotherapy, uh, actually freezing the tumor. You're going to do damage around it, but it may be necessary. Chemotherapy is done in some cases. Okay, now glands, the bulbourethral glands, the little tiny maybe the size of a pea, just under the prostate, right prior to the ejaculate, thick, clear mucus, lubricates the glands and neutralizes the acetic urine in the urethra. Remember the glands is the end of the penis. Okay, semen is a mixture of sperm and then the accessory gland secretions. Has nutrients, a lot of fructose, uh, the semen protects the sperm, activates the sperm, facilitates their movement. Uh, prostaglandins in the semen decreases the viscosity of mucus in the cervix. Generally, when the woman is ready to ovulate, she will already have less mucus in the cervix, but this decreases it even better. And also is thought to stimulate reverse peristalsis in the uterus to help send the sperm in the direction it needs to go to make babies. Okay, semen is, um, neutralizes acid in both the male and the uh, female, the male urethra and the female vagina. There's also antibiotic type chemicals that destroy certain bacteria clotting factors that are going to coagulate the semen immediately after the ejaculation, and then it's going to be liquefied. Now, if you don't listen to anything else in this little thing, two to five mLs of semen per ejaculate, 20 to 150 million 
sperm per ml. So if per se, semen had 20 drops per ml, which is what water has, it probably is not, it's probably thicker than that, it may be 10. But 150,000 sperms per ml, how many does a drop have? If it's 20 ml, if it's 20 drops to an ml, it's 7,500,000. If it's 10 drops to an ml, it's still a whole bunch, more than you need for pregnancy. It only takes one drop, one drop. Okay, the erection. Some of you may have read about this particular phenomenon that is required for copulation. It's the enlargement and stiffening of the penis, and you get engorgement of erectile tissue with blood. Now, what initiates it? Sexual stimuli, touch, uh, erotic sight, sound, smells, um, a cool breeze, a warm breeze, cologne, uh, the beach, roses, candy. Now, that's the females are usually interested in that. Anyway, it's whoever, it's, it's mental, higher mental activity. Whatever floats your boat, you think about it, and you're going to get aroused. And uh, it could be induced or inhibited by emotions. Very much, it's a sympathetic response. I mean, I mean a parasympathetic response. That's on the next slide. To actually have an erection. So the parasympathetic reflex causes a release of nitric oxide at the end arterioles that feed the corpora cavernosa. That's the the blood vessels in the penis. So the erectile tissue fills with blood. Now, as it fills, you get compression of the drainage veins, and so it becomes engorged, and uh, the corpus spongiosum keeps the urethra open. The impotence is the inability to attain or maintain an erection. And that's what Viagra does. Let me go back here, or the other drugs. I don't remember the names of them, but I know Viagra is one of them. It causes vasodilation to the penis by releasing nitric oxide. And it can lower blood pressure. Any of these can lower blood pressure anywhere. Now, ejaculation is a propulsion of semen from the male system. And it's a sympathetic spinal reflex that causes the ducts and glands to empty their contents, contents, the bladder sphincter muscles to constrict so you don't urinate, and then the bulbospongiosis muscles undergo a rapid series of contractions, and um, apparently lots of happiness goes on. Um, you may have heard about, in fact, I had some horror stories told by a paramedic in one of the classes about people who use Viagra, other drugs, and they may take more than they think they need, more than they do need, for the purpose of, you know, getting an erection. And then, okay, so we have parasympathetic. What happens to your uh, heart rate when you're rocking along parasympathetic? It's nice, easy going, things are going great. Then you have a sudden surge of sympathetic reflex. Sympathetic does not just go to one place. You got an overall surge of sympathetic reflex and uh, grandpa has a heart attack. And there was a case some of my students were telling me about that a man met a, a much younger woman. I think he may have paid her or maybe it was his girlfriend. I don't remember the story. But anyway, she had to call his wife and say, hey, um, Fred had a heart attack. You need to come down to the hospital. Well, how do you know Fred? Well, how were you with him when he had the heart attack? You know, and there's Fred with no clothes, et cetera. But anyway, um, very bad situation that could be rather uh, disconcerting to all involved. Okay, now we're going to talk about how you make sperm. The word genesis means making stuff. Spermatogenesis means making sperm. 
and it's a sequence of events that happens in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. Now, these are terms that are used unapologetically on standardized tests. You will hear these repeatedly. The term diploid, also called 2N, means you got a full set of chromosomes, two sets, one from mom, one from dad, and there are 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. That means one matches, one from mom matches one from dad, and so on. Now, gametes are haploid, and they are abbreviated 1N. And this is just important terms to know. Now, we're not going to go through every single step, oh, but I should say we have 20 pairs of chromosomes when it's diploid, 23 chromosomes total when it's haploid. Now, moving along, the term when we get this division, this reduction division, is called meiosis. So we're making our gametes. The nuclear division, and you get the number of chromosomes halved. And you get two rounds of this. So you end up with four daughter cells. And by doing so, they shuffle around the genes and you get genetic variation. Now in anything, in any species, the more varied they are, the more diversity you have in a population, the more likely they are to survive as a species. Um, the cheetah in, uh, I guess it's in the plains of Africa, at some point they were thought to have been killed down to almost nothing. They're almost all genetically identical. So there's a big fear if a virus goes through, the whole species may be gone. And uh, diversity makes a population strong. That goes for bacteria, for humans, for cheetahs, etc. And this is where we get a lot of this, is because of these meiotic divisions and sexual reproduction. Okay, now we start off in uh, meiosis. We start with the mother cell. With mitosis, this is normal cell division, you get reproduction of the DNA, and here's our metaphase. It splits, and you get two identical 2N or diploid daughter cells. So you just identical, like if you're growing new skin cells, this is what you use. During meiosis, you get two sets of reproduction, uh, two sets of division, and you end up with single cell, uh, single M, one M daughter cells. So it will have, in the human species, 23 chromosomes, one M, whereas this is going to be 46 chromosomes. This is going to be half of that. And I had a test that was fill in the blank. And I said, just put on there, you know, how many chromosomes are in a diploid cell? And someone wrote 46. How many are in a haploid cell? And they said 21. It's 23. That's supposed to be an equal sign, but it didn't work very well. Okay. <laughs> anyway. On to the next slide. Now, I, you may have noticed before that males are different than females. Well, making sperm and making eggs is a whole different little process. It's all meiosis, but it's the same thing. But all mitosis and meiosis starts from, uh, you know, you have to have an initial stem cell. But the, the sperm, let me see if I've got a better picture. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip this slide because I've got one that explains it. But this is a good picture to look at because this is a seminiferous tubule. You can see the sperm forming in here. These are going to be your stem cells out here, and they've developed and turned into sperm. Okay, and I'm still waiting for that slide I was going to look at. Hopefully, I'll find it in a minute. Yeah, I think I see it coming up. Okay, here are stem cells here. Now, initially, you get an initial division, uh, which is just a mitotic division. This stem cell divides in the male, and you get a new stem cell, and then a cell that's going to undergo the meiotic process. It's going to divide into where you get sperm. So 
you have a, a basal stem cell and the type A daughter cell is still diploid, 46 chromosomes. This is still diploid, but it won't stay that way eventually. We end up with sperm. And in the male, you get four sperm for every time this process happens. That's how you end up with all those millions and millions. Okay, uh, spermatogonia, that you, they start undergoing division at puberty. And um, let's see. The type A cells maintain the stem cell or germ cell line. The type B cells are going to become spermatocytes. So meiosis one, you're going to get a prime spermatocyte and then two secondary spermatocytes. So you've gotten now you've got division. Meiosis two, they're going to multiply from one end to two end and then divide again. So now you're going to have one, two, three, four sperm. Well, here we have it. This is the initial cell. This is the initial stem cell. It divides by mitosis. This is the type B daughter cell. Type A is there to reproduce again. This undergoes uh, mitosis. It grows and it divides. Now you have secondary spermatocytes, they have one set of chromosomes, and then they divide again, one, two, three, four. Now you've got four uh, spermatids, which eventually become spermatozoa. Okay, spermatids to sperm, they're going to, the difference, they're going to lose excess cytoplasm, they're going to get a tail, and they're actually becoming sperm. Parts of the sperm, you have the head, which is the genetic region, and it has an acrosome, which is your um, little enzyme packet that lets it get into the egg. Midpiece, mitochondria, to burn the fuel, not that's within it, but that's dumped on it. And then the tail, the flagellum. And the, the direction the flagellum goes is just back and forth. The direction the sperm goes is relatively random, but when you've got 150 million, some of them are going to make it all the way. So we start off here, spermatids, 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 spermatids. And finally, we have the acrosome, head, midpiece, and tail. Okay, the Sertoli cells are sustentacular cells. What they do is they, well, several things. They provide nutrients and also signal uh, cells to divide, and they get rid of excess cytoplasm. I told you they ditch their cytoplasm. This is where they do it. And they secrete testicular fluid into the lumen of the uh, seminiferous tubule so that the sperm uh, can be transported. Now, it divides it into junctions. You have the basal compartment, which is uh, the two end, it has the same DNA as dad, and then the ad luminal compartment, which is, they're actually one end. So that's not the same as dad. It doesn't take much to know. Two end is different than one end. And if you've studied the chapter on the immune system, you know that what your immune system captures is non-self, and this is non-self. So, we have the sperm blood barrier, and it's right here, and it's done by these sustentacular cells. And I just said everything that's on here. Um, now, the difference in females uh, is that sperm aren't formed until puberty, and they're absent during the immune system development. They would not be recognized as self, and the sperm would kill them. Now, I mean, the, the immune system would kill them. Now, one thing I forgot to put or took off of this slide that I do regret, uh, testosterone, the things that testosterone does, it causes an increase in muscle mass and bone mass, initially causes a growth spurt, and then it closes the epiphyseal plates so that you can't keep getting taller. Uh, 
the testosterone also uh, is responsible for the ability to have sex, to get an erection, to produce sperm. But the other thing is secondary sexual characteristics. Now, secondary sexual characteristics are things that you could see in a room to help you know what sex a person is. Now, if you've got a beard like this, and then the next person does not, and you know, if you gotta choose one of these as male, it's probably the one with the beard. And we're gonna give her nice long hair. We'll make him bald because male pattern baldness is under the influence of testosterone. So you you can tell, you can look at someone and tell if they're male or female, generally. I, I had one student I had to look at for an entire semester to figure out which. So we are along a continuum. But that was an effort on the student's part to try not to look the sex. They didn't identify as the sex they were. But anyway, um, secondary sexual characteristics are uh, caused by testosterone in the male. And we'll get to the female very shortly. All right. And if you have any questions, you know that you can email me or put something on the discussion board, even start a new thread. And that will be it.